Thank you. So as we begin this evening, uh, tonight, our first, first part on creating safe space, we have uh, two wonderful uh, people sharing with us. The first uh, uh, I'll introduce who we already know is uh, Dr. Bob Phillips, who is uh, Micmac, who holds a doctorate in Indigenous Studies from the University of Toronto, and who has also hosted an arts review program for many years. Uh, Bob has served as an elder at so many of our events, and it's always just a great pleasure to work with, with, with Bob. I don't know, I don't know how else to describe it, but I think uh, Bob, I always just kind of delight in, in being with you and listening to you. And so I'd also like to, uh, as our, our elder tonight, to, to offer you uh, this tobacco as a sign of gratitude and acknowledgement of your knowledge and, and gratitude for your presence with us tonight. So I'll pass things over, over to you, Bob. Well, Chi Megwitch, thank you. That, uh, uh, that is perfect. But I also am just amazed that you can do that uh, digitally as well as in person. So <laughs> Chi Megwitch to you. <laughs> Now, the only problem that I have with, with this is that um, the topic, uh, how to stay safe, and I take it that you, you mean how to stay safe as a facilitator uh, on these uh, things. And when I first started as a, a facilitator with the uh, uh, Jesuit uh, forum here, uh, the first thing they told me was that uh, if I used any swear words at all, Mark Hathaway would beat me up. <laughs> so I think that may be one of the ways to say, uh, stay safe. But on the other hand, humor is also one of the ways to stay safe. If uh, you do have a problem, uh, it, if it's possible to uh, uh, show a... Um, a humorous side to it or to um, even tell a little joke or something uh, that that can help a great deal. Now, as it happens, I have done all kinds of uh, uh, talking circles uh, with uh, young children and older adults. Uh, of course, I've done, uh, served as a facilitator here and, and in doing that, I have very seldom come across something that would be threatening. Under most circumstances, the people that I'm dealing with are like the other people that we see on this screen here today. Uh, comfortable people who, who mean well, who are not there uh, trying to cause a lot of trouble. If I wound up with someone that was there just to disturb everything, ultimately, I would simply uh, go back to the um, uh, people running the, the uh, group and say, wait a minute, this, um, uh, this is a problem and turn it back over to them. But in the meantime, so far, I have not uh, faced that. Usually, uh, the first part of it is everybody has to uh, 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 talk about who they are and, and uh, maybe why they're there, and it is um, at a very short uh, amount of time that is assigned. So when I'm doing that, um, I, I, I also usually point out that time is important because you don't want to use time that somebody else may, uh, may need. And I think most people pick that up fairly well. And I also um, assign uh, who should be speaking like the, the order um, uh, before. And then once I've assigned the order, each person then when they're finished, the next person can. And now sometimes you have a, a close to 10 people uh, to go through, but then other times you've only got maybe four or five people. So the amount of time involved 
also has to be taken into consideration. But once you've gone through, and uh, incidentally, I never uh, take, oh, I'm going to introduce myself first. No. Yes, I, I explain we're going to start off this way, but then I wait until I'm the last person to explain, uh, explain who I am. Then we come to those uh, questions. And uh, once again, I do not start answering those questions. I leave it until I'm the last one. And so each person goes through. And I also, uh, uh, like one of the th uh, uh, factors here is that um, uh, each person is talking about their own ideas, their own concepts. It is not a debate. So I don't have to, uh, uh, I, I mean, when somebody is finished talking, I can simply turn it over to the next person. And if necessary, explain once again that everybody has their own points of view and that those points of view will not be shared with anyone outside of this this thing so that everybody remains comfortable. The next person then can uh, go on without having to, to become involved with a discussion as to whether or not it makes sense. But then occasionally I have had um, false information presented. Like for, for example, uh, 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 native people live for free. There is nothing. Well, then uh, again, I, I, I leave that, move on to the next person. And then when it comes my turn, if that is the most prominent thing, sometimes it's something else. But if it's the most prominent thing, then from my own experience, I will quietly point out that, yes, I, I have heard that as well. But on the other hand, if you look at these sources, you will find that that is not totally true. Uh, and uh, explain why I think that. And then, what, and again, do that fairly briefly. And once again, that business of my starting with a little bit of humor, if, if, there, if it's a difficult thing, my own personal attitude to those people will uh, help to smooth thing out, things out. Having been raised with the idea that I'm no better and no worse than anything else on the face of this earth, including all the other people, I have come to understand that if I treat other people as an equal, they see me as an equal, and that helps uh, to carry out a conversation or uh, a structure that works very well. So under those circumstances, I have very seldom uh, had to uh, alter anything. The most uh, difficult thing that I keep coming up with is I wind up with one person who wants to talk for half an hour. And under those circumstances, I have to as politely, uh, politely as possible um, and say, oh, um, I'm sorry, excuse me, but uh, you know, we are running out, out, out of time. Can you summarize that very briefly? And we've got, we have to go on to the next person. And, and uh, but again, doing it as politely uh, as possible. Uh, under those circumstances, I don't think that we are causing anybody to be upset with us as facilitators or angry with us as facilitators, uh, which means that we are uh, uh, safe in, in terms of facilitators. But we also have to make certain that everybody else is safe and feels safe and understands that it is not a discussion or a place where you can attack other people. I don't know if that makes sense. Uh, 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 what do you think, Mark, that I, uh, or is there a question or something that someone might come up with? I, I think that that's a good beginning. We're going to be hearing from Terry as well and then have some chance for questions. So uh, the, only, the only thing I think I need to, to, to clarify here, Bob, is that Bob is actually much taller than me. So, you know, <laughs> even if I had issued a threat, which I hadn't, it would be totally meaningless. He towers above me. <laughs> well, on the other hand, 
uh, 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 Mark also knows that I joke a lot, which again, when you look at uh, uh, what has happened to indigenous people, humor is one of the ways of dealing with all the negative factors. But Mark and I get along very well. And that's why I was able to use him um, if, if I uh, used uh, uh, Prime, Min uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, somebody would be here to arrest me in 10 minutes. So <laughs> anyway, I apologize for that, Mark. But again, it was a joke. And I think everybody understood that. But the, but the first, I, I know the first time Bob and I met, I, I did kind of look at like, wow, you're really tall. <laughs> Funny thing about Zoom is that you never know how tall other people are. This has happened to me a few other times that I've met someone that I've met on Zoom and realized, oh, you're really tall. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, As I, it I, happens, uh, uh, my uh, name in Ojibwe, Kichimakwa, is Great Bear, and <laughs> they got that quite right. <laughs> no one wants to mess with a great big bear. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Bob. No problem. Uh, at this point, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Terry Baudry. Uh, Terry uh, was born and raised in, in the small village of Rumekong. Uh, she's a missionary sister of the Precious Blood, and she's attended uh, George Brown, St. Michael's, and Regis Colleges. Uh, Terry's been working at the, the Wagan Game Recovery Center, also known as the Rainbow Lodge. Did I get that close? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, for the past uh, 10 years, and we're really happy to have Terry today to talk with us a bit drawing on some of her insights, both from her work and from her uh, work with nonviolent communication. So welcome, Terry. It's great to have you and thanks uh, so much for being here. Thank you, miigwech. Um, yeah, it, it's a uh, nonviolent communication is really a huge topic. Um, just communication itself. Um, and it's something that we do a lot of here. We teach communication, we teach boundaries and, and all kinds of things. Um, when I started reflecting on this, the first, I, I separated the words nonviolent and I thought it, it's really a negative way of phrasing. Maybe perhaps what we want to say a peacefulness or amicability towards one another, but not to be violent. Or it's like saying, I'm not going to be angry uh, when I come. So that, that word kind of, I struggled with that for a while when I was thinking about this. Um, communication is not, um, please stop me whenever. I, I would really, prefer to have a conversation rather than have a monologue. Okay, when I thought of nonviolence, some more of the things that people that popped into my mind was Mahatma Gandhi, if we all remember him, and also Mother Teresa. Um, Gandhi was, was kind of, um, I, I guess more of a pacifist, what I know of him, and that's just the superficial knowledge of him. And Mother Teresa was more of an activist, but, and it was working towards nonviolence. It's working towards peace, towards bettering people's lives. And so communication, of course, is a really great big topic. Communication being an exchange of ideas thoughts, feelings, messages, or information. So nonviolent communication is, is, is a big thing, at least according to me, what I, when I was reflecting. Communication is a topic in itself when we're teaching that to people here, because it's a look at verbal, what we say, um, we look at nonverbals, how we act, how we behave, our facial expressions, everything, and of course the written and the visual communication that are there. And for, for this, for the general communication, 
we really do need the skills necessary. We need to be able to articulate our message verbally, but it needs to be followed by our nonverbals as well. Otherwise, we confuse people when we're saying one thing and acting out another, because confusion can create a little bit of discomfort and maybe misunderstanding, which creates in turn, perhaps hurtful feelings for the people that you're going to be um, that you're going to be talking to, especially in a circle. So, um, and, and there are the figures that we've had in history that are that that really embody nonviolence. And for us, of course, those of us who are Christian, and for us in our Anishinaabe culture, we have our elders. Our elders really embody nonviolence. They embody a peace and acceptance of all people um, if they're really elders. Now we have old people as well, um, just seniors, and they haven't really matured quite well in their own, their own stage or level of life. And so I think um, it, there's a lot to this, at least when, when I'm thinking about it. And I try to put some points so I don't get lost in my thinking because uh, maturity has a lot to do with our, how we conduct ourselves and verbally and non-verbally. Um, and of course, our biggest um, leader, our ideal, the epitome of nonviolence, of course, Jesus, for those of us who are Christian, you know, he, he embodied in his life a state of peace, um, at the same time, having an integrity and authenticity about him, you know, that was real an honesty about him and he was not afraid he was brave to to say what he needed to say and to say it in a very good way and so practice self-awareness and our self-knowledge because if I'm going into a group and I'm really having a rough day you know and I'm trying so hard not to show it I'm trying to act as if um, everything is okay you know your tone of voice might reflect an uneasiness that is there with the people and they will pick up the energy that's there, whether you're saying all the right things or not, they will pick up an energy. And so it's something to really be aware of when you are meeting people to know where you're at yourself, because we can carry um, a negative air about us or already, um, I know what you're going to say, so I'm just waiting for you to finish and I'm going to say it. You know, I'm sure you've met people like that, that are just waiting to say their piece. And so we really need to have that peace and that calmness within ourselves if we're really going to hear. Um, Self-awareness and self-knowledge for me, I think, is a key in creating a safe space because a safe space needs to begin within you and it's not an easy task for many it's something that we run away from we run away from meeting ourselves and it's something that i see a lot of because we're a treatment center for alcohol and drug addiction 
but this is true for all addictions because um, addictions, in a sense, we all have our addictions, whether, you know, they may not be as intense as an alcohol and drug addiction, but an addiction is really an escape from the pain that we all carry. Some of us might, might be doing other things. Some of us might escape to TV. And so, you know, to, because we don't want to face parts of ourselves. So um, when you're facilitating, you need to know where you're at, where you're coming from. You need to be really authentic and really know you, know your weaknesses, know your downfalls, and befriend that aspect of yourself to look deep within you and to look, what is it that motivates me? Why do I want to do this? Why do I feel the need to help, to be a helper? Is it coming from the right place within me? Or is it satisfying a need within me to feel good about myself? Or is it satisfying a need within me to make people really happy? That I want their good, that I want them to be the best person they can be so they can see the beauty of who they are. So you need to, that's one of the things I think, or, or for me is crucial about um meeting people and conducting uh groups you have to know where you're at and we all have bad days and if you're having a bad day and you're coming into a group first of all it's really important to say it tell the group hey i really had new bad news before coming in so if i look a little distracted sometimes please forgive me. My mind is someplace else, or my daughter had bad news, or I'm really preoccupied with something, but I really want to be here with you. So, you know, if you state that, that diffuses a lot of the negative energy that you may be coming with into a group. So to look deep within you, um, Awareness, yeah, awareness of why you do things and what you're doing. Types of communication we talked about. Now, Victoria said it's, it's about 20, it should be about 20 minutes. So you need to know your tone of voice when you speak. I had a friend once years ago and we were in the house together and somebody came to the door and usually she's very nice and very polite. But when this person came in, her voice rose to a pitch. And I thought there was such a, a, a kind of attitude that came over her. And I thought, oh, how can she be like that? I, I was really shocked. And I thought, and here, we're, we're supposed to be polite and welcoming. And after this guy left, he disappeared and she turned to me and said, you know, she said, I am, I was so nervous. She said, and I looked at her and I said, why? She said, I was so nervous because of, and I forget why, but she said, you know, and I know when I get nervous, my voice rises to a pitch and she changed completely. So you know, and I thought, oh, she knows that about herself. And when she told me that, I could tell when she was nervous and when her voice, when she was acting, when she, when she acted with an attitude. And I thought, oh, there must be something up. But normally I would think, ah, oh, avoid her, you know, stay away from her. But, you know, we have to know those things about ourselves when you're going into a group. Um, facial expressions are important. 
um, eyes who and also who are the group you are talking to what is their background what is appropriate i remember when my sister first came to visit me in the convent and my mother and they were there and my sister wouldn't look very much at the sister who was in charge and i said to her look at her and she said but it's really impolite. I, I can't look at her, you know? I don't want to look at her eyes. I, I No, that's not polite. And I said, no, here, you're supposed to look at people in the face. You know, you're supposed to look at them when you're talking to them. So, you know, you have to know the culture of the people, whether it's, it's their cultural, traditional background, or if they're a senior, or if they're a very young person, if they're a teenager, or if they're coming from a lower economic background, or from a very educated background, or wherever they're coming from. Because you have to know a little bit of their culture and where you can meet them. Um, what level, I guess, where you can meet them at. So you need good active listening skills. So we can't be distracted. And if I'm sitting here while looking at my phone while you're talking, well, that's telling you something. Or if I'm fidgeting with something, um, if I'm acting nervous, that's, that's sending out a message and an energy. Um, body language is important. Of course, those are there's our basic um, basic body languages that I think you probably all know. If you're sitting cross arm, that means leave me alone. Um, you know, everybody has their expressions. My niece, um, she was about thirteen or fourteen a few years ago she's now 19 or 20 and there were times when you tell her something and she would say talk to the hand you know and i thought that's that's a young person's way of communicating you know and it's also saying claiming her space hey this is my boundary i don't want to hear this right now you know they're you have to know what they're saying. And somebody might be very insulted. So we have to know gestures of the people that we're meeting, the people that are in your group. And it's good to know your priorities and your values. Uh, know their priorities and their values because then you'll know where to connect with them. Um, everything I would say that is the opposite of what we call our Mishomis teachings, our grandfather teachings, and I think opposite of all the Christian virtues you were taught as Christians or from whatever religious background you're from, opposite those. If you do those, it, it's going to be create disharmony. It's going to create a very negative attitude. I don't know if it'll create violence, but it might. Something that's very, a violence that is subtle. So when we disrespect people intentionally and unintentionally, um, it creates uh, a little bit of a violence for that person. When we are dishonest to a person regarding uh, something we're saying or we're acting. That's why it's really necessary to be authentic, to be real. To, because if you're not, if you're trying to project an image of yourself that is not real, that's becoming a little bit towards dishonesty. You know, I'm not who you say I who you think I am, but this is who I want you to see me as. So 
you know, and that's why it's important if, if you're having a bad day, say you're having a bad day, acknowledge your humanity and that we're not, I was telling this to somebody recently, one of my coworkers, a few of our community members have passed through overdose and some one or two have been her people she had seen and she of course she really feels badly and so I have to say and I said to her you know for me I, I need to accept my humanity and to know that I am not perfect and I make mistakes but I also know that I'm doing the best that I can and in the honest sense, in, in the truest sense of my heart, I'm doing my best. And so, and the rest I have to leave. And so it's acknowledging our humanity. We are not the creator. We are not God. And so I said, and more we can't do. You are here, you're doing your best. And it's the same when you meet in a group, when you talk to your the people that you're there with if you say or do something that you're sorry for later well and if you don't have a chance to come back to it and say hey i said this earlier i take it back you know another thought just popped into my mind that's really not true i don't think i meant that or or something else and if you can't ignore if you can't correct it just go on with it and know you're human and we make mistakes so acknowledging our own humanity is so important so some of our teachings bravery courage are, are another one and that's the part that is really hard difficult for many because they don't want to acknowledge the pain that they're carrying and so people resort to drugs alcohol people will resort to other behaviors that are not healthy because they're trying to forget this part or pretend it's not there because if i acknowledge my pain it shows i'm weak and i'm less of a person if i'm weak and of course we know that's not true so, um, yeah, learn the skills, anything opposite of, of the virtues that you've learned as a child or things that were valuable. When we act in opposition to those, we are becoming a little bit violent in a subtle way. And so, and part of it is acknowledging our ego, our negative ego. So, and making friends with that and knowing that and saying, yes, ah, there I go again, um, you know, and to say, oh, here I'm trying to be number one, you know, but to, to know, hey, you know, I do it all the time. So just say, I, I'm so sorry, I wasn't thinking, you know, come back again and say sorry. So our self-concept is really important. What is our self-concept? Um, communication is a two-way event and to be able to listen, not just with the ears, but listen, look at the eyes, look at their body, look at their gestures. What are they saying? Um, and what are you interpreting of what they're saying? Because we all have our own lens. We all have our own glasses and the color of our own glasses. Because we all, each and every one of us come from our own backgrounds and what we were taught. What we think is good is not necessarily helpful. One of the sisters in my community, some months ago, when the church was really, when this residential school thing came out, she sent out, um, she sent out a, a big common email about how this 
missionary, and I don't know who the missionary was. I, I read some of it, and I thought, oh, how can you send that out, you know? And the good work that this person did among First Nations people, among our people, and how they helped them, how they brought this and that, and how they taught them. And I said to her, I had emailed her, and I said, can you hear and read what you're saying and what you're promoting? And you know, anyway, we conversed a bit, and then she said, I'm just trying to build up, you know, you, I, I guess she was feeling battered, and I'm sure we have all felt battered as a church to face our own weaknesses, and they're ours. They're our, it's our history, it's where we've come from, and so in looking at that, and it's, it's unpleasant to look at it, but we need to look at it, acknowledge it, own it, claim it, and move on. And for her, I think she was just trying to brush over it. Anyway, we, I don't know, I don't remember if we saw eye to eye, but anyway, you know, we, we have to look at where we're coming from. Everybody has their own history. So you come with your lens. Um, yeah, I think that's basically, it's just to practice, practice listening, practice becoming aware and self-awareness. We did this once with some clients and the one that some of you might remember years ago, um, it, it, it's a term called the Harry window. And it's a way of, of looking at oneself and exploring oneself. And you look at yourself and you ask people around you who know you well to give you feedback on you. And so, and they say that's how we kind of push the window to our self awareness and self knowledge a little bit more. So, you know, I think we all need to do that. And we all need to as we push that window back a little bit or the window panes to our self-awareness as people, I think we all um, will face some dark hidden corners in their cobwebs that we need to clean out. And once we've cleaned them out, I think then um, we will be ready to will be ready to face anything because there will be nothing holding us back because um, nothing will be hidden anymore. And so we'll be free. But as long as we have things to hide, as long as we, um, we put on personas, I guess we put on images of who we are, or how I am, and I, I, I am caught there sometimes to identify myself as a missionary sister because it's, I don't want that to be my identity, but I also don't disown that part of who I am because it's a big part of my life, but it, it's also not my identity. Underneath all that, I'm just another person. I'm just another Anishinaabe who grew up, who lived and grew up in Wiki, who belongs to a group of other like-minded women. So, you know, that we don't get stuck behind images. Anyway, um, anything else? I think my 20 minutes is up. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sherry. I think that that's wonderful. I'm just putting a few words in the chat, which actually I, I was hearing as you were, were talking. So uh, the importance of mutual respect, openness, humility, courage, uh, paying attention to others, but also self-awareness and empathy. I mean, I think all those things combine. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, th I think part of what this whole sharing circle methodology about is, is really 
modeling right relationships, right? It's, it's learning ways of communicating that are based on right relationship and those values of mutual respect and listening and really valuing the other and, and learning from each other and weaving that together. So I think you know, all these things are, are what both you and uh, Bob shared. I think all these things are, are so important in terms of what we're doing. So maybe just uh, give a few minutes if there were any questions or anything that was coming up for people as you were listening, uh, maybe you can take maybe five or, or eight minutes for some comments or questions before we move into the circles. Uh, Maureen? Um, I was recently in a, uh, a circle, a small breakout room, uh, not in this form, but, uh, and there was one person who started out sharing very negatively and uh, went on for quite a long time. And we didn't even know who was the facilitator in the small group actually, which, which was okay. But eventually that person spoke up uh, and uh, basically asked the person to let someone else have a turn speaking. But my, my sense was that maybe this person should have gone back to the main room and talked to the organizers as opposed to venting in this little group because we were there for a specific discussion and, and he had taken over. So I'm just wondering how you would handle that. Um, Go ahead, Terry. I guess for me, what I would probably do is just let him go on for a little bit. And then after a while, if there's a small breathing, taking a breath or something, jump in there and say, you know, you sound like you're really having a very hard time right now. Would you like to talk more about this after the meeting? You know, I'd be happy to stay with you, but let's listen to what the others have to say right now, because it's not to put him down or to, but to acknowledge what he's carrying, to maybe say you're carrying a lot of, um, a lot of hurt feelings or whatever it is that he's saying. That um, might be what I would do. He was basically saying that whatever they were teaching was wrong. They were going about the whole program in the wrong way. And in my mind, the others of us turned out to be quite satisfied. So as I said, I'm, I'm thinking maybe he should have been offered. Would you like to speak to the, the, the person mm -hmm. who did the presentation? I don't know. It, it was very awkward. Um, he wanted to correct everything that had been said in the main presentation. <laughs> so it was kind of a debating kind of thing. And um, anyway, it may be, those people. Yeah, and it may I, be in the context of, of kind of our sharing circles that we're doing with the guide. Uh, I think a really important thing, certainly particularly the first meeting, but even to remind people just some of those basic ground rules that you know, we're all taking a turn, we're so much time, each person, we're here to listen to each other, you know, out of mutual respect, we're not here for debate, we're, you know, even some of setting those kind of ground rules at the beginning can maybe help remind people. I, I mean, it doesn't mean you will always prevent <laughs> those situations, mm -hmm. but it might help prevent some of them as well. I don't know, Bob, if you have anything to add or anything that you'd like to, to add to that. One of the uh, good things, uh, 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 for example, with um, uh, uh, Trevor, uh, usually when he starts a thing, he before he turns it over to uh, to uh, everybody to like him to break down in, into small groups. He goes through those points one after the other after the other uh, so that uh, here 
uh, we start with a uh, with those basic ideas in our mind, and then it makes it very easy for me if I have to uh, 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 jump in and and very uh, nicely say sorry. Uh, can we um, uh, sort of uh, get on with it? But Terry's point was also very very sound. If uh, that person is seen to have serious problems, it might be wise to say, well, wait a minute, afterwards, maybe we could, can we, well, we'll go on to the next person right now. Because if that person needs help, maybe that's why they're there in the first place. And if we can help them so much, the better. But other than that, everyone is allowed to speak in uh, um, sometimes they may not be complaining about everything, but they'll have one or two ideas that, uh, well, fine. But then we go on to the next person. Does that make sense? This, after all, uh, for uh, um, people in these these little chats, part of it is getting out what uh, uh, hurts you, and. Um, doing it comfortably, I think, helps. Are there any other questions uh, that people had? Mark, maybe if I could add something? Sure. Like echo something that uh, you brought up, Terry, and that's related to like how we are, um, the spaces that we find ourselves in. You know, we're human beings and you know, if it's, uh, we're gathering at the end of the afternoon or something, we could have had a very busy, stressful day. And in some of the groups I've been with, when we, the first thing we do when we gather is how we come. And it's called, that's the title of this portion of the meeting, how we come. Uh, it's very brief, you know, but it's a way to listen to each other as human beings. And it's a way to know how to read each other for the remainder of the meeting. You know, uh, when someone's not sharing very much, then you go back and say, oh, that person mentioned that, you know, they had a stressful day or something. So there's a little bit of context in which we can listen to one another. You know, that how you come moment. And that's like, we just go around in a circle. Each of us say how we come. And that's really, really helpful to know how to, to be present with one another. You know, when we know someone is in a bit of a bad mood or distracted, you know, it, it helps our listening, you know, and, and how we read people. That's a great suggestion for the beginning of a session. And it could it probably only takes like what, 15, 20 seconds each, but uh, yeah. just kind of set the tone. Yeah. Good idea. Uh, anything else? Or should we go ahead and move into our smaller practice facilitation sessions? I will come back again after that as well. So if anything comes up uh, when you're in the smaller circle, that's also fine. We will have another chance. Uh, but maybe we should go ahead and break into to small groups and just remember everyone, someone who hasn't, who, who did, someone who didn't do the practice facilitation last time will be doing uh, someone to volunteer to do that today uh, around uh, the question we have. Uh, from ties of kinship, basically.